Joined on the phone today by author John Byrne Cook. His new book, On the Road with Janis Joplin. He was the road manager for Janis. How are you today, John? I'm doing well. Hi, Dustin. It's great to have you on. This is definitely a book I'm excited about. Can you tell the listeners a little bit about it, On the Road with Janis Joplin? Well, there's been a lot of books about Janis, but I realized that I had a story to tell, which uh, actually I am the only person who can tell it because I'm the only one who traveled with all three of the bands that she played with during what we could call her national career from the Monterey Pop Festival, June 67, until her death in, in October 1970. Her life really was on the road. It was that hour on stage at the end of each evening traveling from city to city, and uh, it's a perspective that I think is really important in getting to know Janis Joplin. So I've tried my best to give in this book some information that nobody, anybody, no matter how much you've read about Janis or think you think about, know about Janis, I hope that they will find in this book something they hadn't known before that will help round out the picture of this extraordinary woman. Yeah, most definitely. A lot of people, obviously a huge fan of her work. Can you tell us a little bit about how you wound up being on the road with her as her manager? Sure. Uh, I was a performing musician. I was playing bluegrass and old-time music with a band in Cambridge, Massachusetts during the early 60s and up into the mid-60s, the the great folk revival. And then folks started turning into folk rock and rock and roll. It was a small family back in those early days, and we knew... In Cambridge, we knew the people in in Greenwich Village, and I had met Bob Dylan and his manager, Albert Grossman. And after Janice and Big Brother and the Holding Company's enormous success at the Monterey Pop Festival, June 67, a few months after that, Albert Grossman signed to manage Janice and Big Brother, and he hired me to be the road manager. And can you tell us a little bit about those early days on the road? I mean, Janice seemed like such a free spirit, so was it difficult to kind of make sure she got to where she needed to go? Or No, she wasn't She wasn't the problem. In every band, there's somebody who's always late. And oddly enough, it's usually one of the guitar players. Ah. So actually, the first two months that I was working with them, we were uh, working entirely in California. Albert Grossman was planning their their debut in in the East Coast, particularly New York, where they would be judged by the rock press of the day. And uh, so I had uh, quite a lot of time to get to know them before we went on the the national tour and going out to the eastern part of the country. And uh, Janice was, uh, you know, she was totally dedicated to the success of the band, to her singing, to making that connection with the audience. And uh, it's funny, everybody thinks, gosh, it must have been a awful hard time with all the wild partying and the drinking and the drugs and but you know this wasn't a band that smashed up their hotel rooms and did some of the most outrageous things that you've you've heard about it really was a bunch of people traveling together on the road with a with a common purpose which is to get there and do the show and and do it as well as possible for sure again we're on the phone today with john Byrne cook he's the author of the book on the road with janice joplin and uh, can you kind of describe that time when Cheap Thrills, the album, came out? It seemed like, uh, you know, her popularity kind of exploded. Was that just like a completely crazy time that kind of flipped the switch from maybe normal uh, normal job to hectic job? Well, you know, the, the big jump had happened before Cheap Thrills. I mean, Cheap Thrills was a very successful album, went gold within a few days of, of its release. But for Janice and Big Brother... The, the appearance at the Monterey Pop Festival the year before, and, uh, she and Jimi Hendrix were the two who emerged from that festival as kind of overnight stars. And from that time on, uh, you know, the focus was really on them. And when we did come east and, and play in the east and uh, all through, when we played in, in the northeast and all through the, the Midwest, we were based in New York City and we'd be going out and playing three or four days on the weekends. And... Uh, the notice in the press focused on Janice, and, and she was, by the time she Thrills came out, she was really well known. So the record itself didn't make a change. The change was the steady rise of her uh, fame during that time. And, and as she expanded her fan base all across the country, it was, it was something to see. So with that being said, was that sort of the reason why she decided to leave a big brother in the holding company? Maybe she was just... Uh you know, kind of leaving them behind as far as popularity goes or stardom? Well, there was a certain 
there was a certain effect from the fact that the press and the fans, to some extent, focused more on her. There were some reviews that said the band isn't up to, you know, their lead singer. But uh, she loved those guys, and she recognized that this was a band that had existed before she joined them, that took her in, and that she they powered her to her success at Monterey and to the su- success of the Cheap Thrills album. Uh, but she saw a greater challenge, uh, and once she saw it, she had to do it to find out if she could do it, and that was to go out as a solo uh, act a, a star on her own, standing in the spotlight, and and doing the whole job by herself with a backup band behind her. And uh, her first effort at doing that just about it ultimately failed. So she almost fell flat on her face. In 1969, the band called Cosmic Blues certainly had their moments, and it was not by any means a, a failure from start to finish. But it didn't become what she wanted it to become. And those were that was really her toughest year of the three years I was with her, the middle year with Cosmic Blues. Yeah, and you talk about her maybe being afraid to uh, branch out on her own. And I've heard stories that her performance at Woodstock, maybe she wasn't uh, real happy with that. What are, what are your memories of that time? Well, you know, we had looked forward to Woodstock. We hoped it would be kind of a bigger version of Monterey. Nobody foresaw that there were going to be, um, you know, a quarter to a half a million people showing up. Uh, we had hoped to spend more time at the site and, and uh, 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 get to hear a lot of the other acts. When we got there, we found that you know the roads were clogged. They were bringing bands into the site by helicopter and just trying to get each band there in time to play. So we didn't actually get in. Uh, to, we'd gotten there a day ahead of time, but we didn't get into the site till late Saturday afternoon, and she was scheduled to play on Saturday evening, and and the effect on her performance really was the fact that from the start at Woodstock, everything was running late, and they were doing their best. There were a lot of people working really hard, and uh, but I think it may have been after midnight when we finally got on, and Janice was tired, the band was tired. Usually when she got on stage, the adrenaline would power her, and if you look at film from that performance, you can certainly see that adrenaline working, but uh, in terms musically, uh, it wasn't one of her best performances. I think it may not have been in the original edit of the Woodstock movie. It is now. You can see it in the longer, I don't know if they call it the director's cut, but you know there it is, and uh, you wouldn't put it in her top ten performances, but uh, you'd see somebody giving her all for sure. Yeah, most definitely. Again, we're on today with John Byrne Cook, the author of the book On the Road with Janis Joplin. And uh, she seemed like kind of the person that liked to change things up a little bit. You mentioned the Cosmic Blues Band and, of course, uh, Full Tilt Boogie. So if you think Janice uh, were still with us, what direction do you think her career might have gone in? Well, you know, uh, in her last year, she was really happy with Full Tilt Boogie, and she was really happy with uh, the relationship with the, her record producer. Uh, hadn't really had a good relationship with her earlier record producers, and Janice and her producer for the Pearl album with Full Tilt Boogie, Paul Rothschild, were talking not just about that album, but they were looking ahead. So she was, for the first time, looking forward to a longer recording and singing career than she thought she might have had. She said many times, and that she truly expected that she would blow her voice out at a young age because she uh, would never give anything less than everything she had to give to the song. But between her and Paul Rothschild, he was asking her to look at the different voices she had, the different parts of her range, to look a little more critically at when to go absolutely full power. And she was absolutely going for all of it. She was amazed at these concepts that hadn't occurred to her before and was seeing a longer career. So I would like to think that she would be one of the people, you know, look around, look at the gray-haired rockers that we see. Look at the people from the 60s who are still performing, and I would like to think that she would be one of those. Excellent. Well, again, John, the book On the Road with Janis Joplin is available now, and it looks great. I'm looking forward to uh, finishing it, and I know the listeners are as well. Thanks a lot for being on with us today. Dustin, thanks so much for having me. My pleasure.